सो एज यू गाइज नो दैट केमिस्ट्री वी डिवाइड जनरली इन टू थ्री पोर्शन फिजिकल ऑर्गेनिक एंड इनऑर्गेनिक केमिस्ट्री देन स्ट्रक्चर ऑफ एटम अगेन अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट चैप्टर लाइक इट हैज मेनी इंपॉर्टेंट टॉपिक्स लाइक इफ यू गेट योर सेल्फ स्टक समवेयर इफ यू हैव एनी डाउट देन रिप्ले दिस एंड गो थ्रू द सोल्यूशन राइट अदरवाइज ट्राई टू डू इट ऑन योर ओन तो अ सिंपल क्वेश्चन बट लेट मी टेल यू वेर डू यू गाइज टेंट टू मेक मिस्टेक्स इन सच क्वेश्चन इज द कैलकुलेशन आइदर यू थिंक दैट दिस क्वेश्चन इज ईजी तो क्वांटम मैकेनिकल मॉडल इज समथिंग विच यू हैव टू डू वेरी थरली राइट बिकॉज यू गाइज नो दैट अ लॉट ऑफ अंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑफ केमिस्ट्री डिपेंड्स अपॉन हाउ वेल यू अंडरस्टैंड द क्वांटम मैकेनिकल मॉडल सो दिस इज वन गुड क्वेश्चन दैट वॉज दैट हैज बीन आस्ड इन पी वाई क्यूज सो आई पिक दिस अप If I say gases have higher kinetic energy or liquids have higher kinetic energy, similarly there are other qualitative properties like elevation of boiling point, relative lowering of vapor pressure, and osmotic pressure. What is the wave number for the shortest wavelength transition? That is the shortest wavelength, minimum wavelength. That is maximum energy. So Planck's equation, which is it's a very basic equation, right? For the interconversion of uh, um, energy with frequency, wave number, etc. Okay. Good evening, students. Welcome to this amazing YouTube session on some important questions for your JE exam, right? For the April session, I'm sure आप सब लोगों की जो preparation है वो full pace पे चल रही होगी. Now you guys are revising all the important points that you highlighted earlier, right? So this is uh, the time to give a final touch to your preparation and with an aim to help you guys in your this wonderful. journey right towards your goal we have brought this amazing youtube series where we will cover the entire syllabus of all the three subjects uh, that are part of je in uh, 10 to 12 sessions right so as you guys know that chemistry we divide generally into three portions physical organic and inorganic chemistry to hum aap logo ke liye youtube session yahan par laaye hain hum kya karenge isme physical chemistry ke we will keep three sessions right we will uh, equally divide three chapters in each session we will cover then similarly for organic chemistry and then for inorganic chemistry like that okay so for example today's chapters of this youtube session they are some basic concepts of chemistry you guys know that mole concept stoichiometry concentration terms some of these are very very important topics for je then structure of atom again a very important chapter like uh, it has many important topics like photoelectric effect Bohr's model of atom, quantum mechanical model of atom, dual nature of matter, and this chapter also helps you with your preparation in physics, right? Because you know that in your modern physics, a uh, lot of concepts are similar. And then we will discuss some important questions from solutions, which is actually a part of class twelfth curriculum. It has again many important topics from which almost every year JE asks questions. Uh, for example, Raoult's law, Henry's law, Van t Hoff factor, qualitative properties like that. Okay, so. what is the uh, agenda of today's session is that i have picked some very important questions for you based on the very uh, repetitive concepts right i'll show you the question if you're watching this video you can pause the video solve the question yourself and come back and check your answer if you're not confident of the concept itself then uh, in every question first i will discuss what is a background concept okay then you can watch the background concept then pause the video solve the question and then come back again and if this is not your forte this topic this question is in your forte then you should watch the detailed solution of each and every question here in this session right so uh, let us start with a very simple question from mole concept from some basic concepts of chemistry using the rules for significant figures the correct answer for the expression now significant figure is something that not only j main j advance has uh, also been asking questions right almost every year uh, they ask questions in chemistry as well as physics right so what are the rules for significant figures okay all non zero digits are significant we know that then zeros are only significant if uh, they are between two non zero digits right for example if i say 8008 so these two zeros are significant right because they are flanked by two non zero digits okay terminal zeros are significant only if there is a decimal point for example i say 7 8 9 0 this zero is not significant because there is no decimal point but the moment i put a decimal point does not matter where does not matter where this zero now becomes significant so now it has four significant figures now what are the rules for uh, when you do the calculation right in significant figures what are the rules so please remember that when you do addition and subtraction 
then you see the number of decimal places right for example if you are uh, let's say adding 80.08 okay and then 7.1 you are adding these numbers now you can see that the first number has two decimal places and the second number has one decimal place so your final answer should have only one decimal place that means in addition and subtraction we see the number of decimal places but in multiplication and division we see the total number of significant figures in every number right so for example here you can see that this is a case of multiplication and division how many significant figures are here how many significant figures are here is starting zeros are never significant please remember that okay and all non zero digits are significant so this one has four significant figure right this one has three significant figure all right and this one has again four significant figure okay so this number is four this number is three and this number is four significant figure now the rule says that when you multiply or divide numbers then the final result should have the as many significant figures as the number having least number of significant figures which is three here so your final answer should have exactly three significant figures so not this one not this one not this one but this one right because you can see that this has three significant digits so that is a correct answer to this question all right moving forward to the next question this one uh, it is generally seen that they ask questions based upon uh, the uh, stoichiometry and the limiting reagent so limiting reactant or limiting reagent you guys know it's something very very important and in such questions you should be very careful with the calculations all right so how do we go about this question the equation is given fe3o4 plus 4co gives 3fe plus 4co2 right the masses of both the reactants are given 4.64 kg of 4 point, uh, of fe3o4 and 2.52 kg of carbon monoxide okay so now you can see that the amount of both the reactants are given okay let us approach this solution very carefully noting all the important points all the gray areas where you guys tend to make mistakes confusion areas right so fe3o4 and carbon monoxide the masses of both the reactants are given so please remember that if the mass of one reactant is given you can directly calculate the mass of another re reactant required or the mass of any product formed but if you are given the mass of more than one reactant then we use the concept of limiting reactant all right so how do we find limiting reactant in this case the question is what is the amount of iron formed okay now amount of iron formed cannot be calculated unless you determine which is the limiting reactant and how do we find the limiting reactant i'll tell you a shortcut today simply divide number of moles or uh, you can take volume also if the substance is a gas you can take volume also by the stoichiometric coefficient by the stoichiometric coefficient right the ratio which has the minimum value will be your limiting reactant so what basically i am saying here is that you calculate fe3o4 number of moles the number of moles of fe3o4 number of moles of carbon monoxide then divide those number of moles by their stoichiometric coefficient the coefficient of fe3o4 is 1 and the coefficient of carbon monoxide is 4 so you divide by them the one having the lower value of this ratio will be your limiting reagent and then using that you can calculate what is the mass of the product formed okay now remaining is calculation in this question i shall help you out but uh, if you're watching this video i would highly recommend please pause the video and solve this question yourself if you get yourself stuck somewhere if you have any doubt then uh, replay this and go through the solution right otherwise try to do it on your own so meanwhile i'm doing it uh, fe3 or 4 calculate the molar mass 56 into 3 168 and oxygen So molar mass of Fe3O4 is 232 gram per mole and molar mass of carbon monoxide of course uh, that is 28 gram per mole. Alright, okay. So what do we do? First we calculate the number of moles of Fe3O4. So how do we calculate the number of moles of Fe3O4? Mass 
which is given to be 4.64. Now, some students in haste, they will make a mistake. They will ignore this kg, right? Please don't ignore this kg, okay? Please don't ignore this kg, all right? So, this is the mass in gram divided by the molar mass of Fe3O4, which we just calculated. It is 232. Okay, now you do this calculation. This is 4640. And when you calculate, then this will be 20. All right, this will be 20. So the number of moles of Fe3O4, that will be 20 mole. So we have calculated that. Now, what is the number of moles of carbon monoxide? That is given to be 2.52, right? So number of moles of carbon monoxide, that is 2.52 into 1000 gram divided by the molar mass, right? Is that clear? So this is 28 gram molar, uh, per mole is the molar mass and the mass of carbon monoxide is 2.520. So which is basically 2520. Now if you will cancel it, this will cancel by I think uh, 9, right? You will get 90, right? Because uh, 280 minus 28 is 252, yes. So this will give you 90, okay? Adjusted that. So the number of moles of carbon monoxide that is 90 and the number of moles of Fe3O4 that is 20. Now obviously what you will do, you will divide these number of moles by the stoichiometric coefficient. Okay, let us do it here itself. For Fe3O4 number of moles is 20 and coefficient is 1, right? Coefficient is 1. For carbon monoxide number of moles is 90 divided by coefficient is 4. Okay. So, which is the limiting reagent, guys? Which is the limiting reagent? Of course, you can see that. Right? So, which is the lower value? 20. So, which is the limiting reagent? Of course, Fe3O4. Right? Which is the limiting reagent? Of course, Fe3O4. Now, again, look at the chemical equation. One mole of Fe3O4 gives you three mole of iron. That is, the amount of iron is three times the amount of Fe3O4. All right? So, the moles of Fe3O4 is 20. So, number of moles of iron that will form is uh, 3 times, of course, as per the stoichiometric relation. So, this is 3 multiplied by 20, which is 60 mole. Alright, so the amount of iron is 60 mole. Now, the question is, ki what is the amount of iron in gram that is produced, right? And we know the atomic mass of iron is 50. 6 okay so the mass of iron that will be is 56 multiplied by 60 gram okay so that will be uh, 3360 gram okay that will be the correct answer of this question so a simple question but let me tell you where do you guys tend to make mistakes in such question is the calculation either you think that this question is easy you will get it and in doing so, you make a very silly mistake or a calculation mistake is very common in these questions, okay? So whenever you see that a question is very easy, just add a bit of focus to it. Just don't take it for granted, okay? Just thinking, okay, I'll do this question. I've done it many times. I'll do this this time also. No, be careful because even if you make a very slight, tiny, silly mistake, you get the wrong answer, right? And then you re regret that an easy question you cannot do, right? So focus is very important. Now this question from the structure of atom. So quantum mechanical model is something which you have to do very thoroughly, right? Because you guys know that a lot of uh, understanding of chemistry depends upon how well you understand the quantum mechanical model. When I say this, uh, I'm talking about the quantum numbers, right? Uh, what are the orbitals, their shapes, okay? Their signs, their nodes, what are their energies, other concepts like effective nuclear charge, all of that, right? So let us look at this. Electronic configuration is something please prepare, right? Because J has been asking electronic configuration many times. They uh, do ask electronic configuration of some D block elements. They do ask electronic configuration of some F block elements. So please go through some important, just go through previous year question papers and in the last 10 or 20 years, uh, the electronic configurations which have been asked, just uh, remember them, right? So we guys know that because of the extra stability of half filled D subshell, the electronic configuration of chromium is an exception, right? Instead of 3D4, 4S2, this is 3D5, 4S1. So yes, the electronic configuration of chromium is 
3D5 4S1, right? Another exception that we see in 3D series uh, is uh, copper, right? So copper is again, that is argon 3D10 and 4S1. So there are some important exceptions to the electronic configuration, which you should know. The magnetic quantum number may have a negative value. Magnetic quantum number means M, okay? So uh, let me walk through uh, quantum numbers here, right? So please remember that quantum numbers is nothing but they identify each electron in an atom. Okay guys, let us uh, revise it quickly. So first quantum number is principal quantum number. It tells you about the main energy shell, right? If you find the speed of this video too fast, you know you can watch it at 0.75x, okay? If you feel that you have a catching up to do and uh, you actually uh, want to just listen to the entire concept, you can watch this video at 0.75x also. So the first quantum number is principal quantum number. It tells you about the shell. The allowed values are 1, 2, 3, 4, so on. And we know that their designations are capital letters as in K, L, M and L also, right? Now we know each shell is divided into some subshells, which is identified by the value of L, right? Now for a given shell, that is the value of N, the allowed values of L, they run from 0, 1, 2 until N minus 1. They run from 0, 1, 2 until N minus 1, okay? For example, if you take N is equal to 5, the values of L are 0, 1, 2, 3 and 4. They always are 1 less than the value of N. Now L is equal to 0 means S subshell, 1 is P, 2 is D, 3 is F and uh, 4 G you will never need, right? So these are subshells. Now each subshell is further divided into some orbitals, right? So N defines shell, L defines subshell. Okay, I'll write here and N defines orbital, right? M defines orbital. Now the allowed values of uh, the this magnetic quantum number, they are from minus L to plus L, right? In integers, minus L to plus L. So if you talk about the uh, second subshell, that is P subshell. So for P subshell, we know the L value is one, right? L value is one. So the M value would be minus one, zero and plus one. So yes, because M range is from minus L to plus L, magnetic quantum number can have negative value, right? So this statement is also correct. Statement B is correct and statement A is also correct. Then in the ground state of an atom, orbitals are filled in order of their increasing energies. Is that correct? Absolutely. This is Aufbau principle that in the ground state of an atom, orbitals are always filled, electrons are always filled in the orbitals in order of the increasing energies. This is simply related to stability, right? The lower energy orbital should get electron first. So that is Aufbau principle, that is also correct. Last one, the total number of nodes are given by n minus 2. Is that correct? No, right? Because let me again tell you, nodes are of two types. Okay, guys, nodes are of two types, angular and radial. Nodes are of two types, angular and radial nodes, right? Angular nodes, they are nodal planes actually they are equal to the value of L. For example, S orbital does not have any angular node. P orbital has one angular node, one nodal plane. D orbitals have two nodal planes and so on. Radial nodes, they are given by N minus L minus one, right? N is the shell number. For example, if you're calculating the radial nodes in 3P, so the value of N is three, right? Minus L value, we know that L value is uh, one for P uh, orbital, we just discussed this, minus one. So there is one radial node, right? So basically angular nodes are L, radial nodes are N minus L minus one. So total nodes are not N minus two, but N minus one, all right? So this statement is incorrect. And hence the correct statements are A, B and C, okay? So through these questions, we are revising the important concepts and we are also seeing how J can ask questions based upon that, okay? So I think this is the uh, fastest way to revise, okay? Run through, uh, revise all the syllabus. Moving to the next question. This question is from solutions. 
Now, vent hoff factor and colligative properties, you people know it's a very, very important topic from solutions chapter. Read this question. 1.2 ml of acetic acid is dissolved in water to make 2 liter of solution. The depression in freezing point observed for this strength uh, of the acid is 0 0.0198 degrees Celsius. The question is what is the percentage dissociation of the acid, right? So there are uh, two things involved here mainly. First, they have talked about freezing point depression, okay? So what is the formula of freezing point depression? We guys know that uh, first thing, depression in freezing point is the freezing point of pure solvent minus the freezing point of solution, right? Because you know that when you add non-volatile solute to a volatile solvent, the vapor pressure of the liquid solvent decreases, right? So as a result, now the solvent uh, freezes at a lower temperature, right? So delta Tf is T naught F minus Tf, freezing point of pure substance minus freezing point of solution. We also have another formula. I'll just directly write the complete formula. Right, okay. This is the formula you will ever need for depression of freezing point. I is a Van't Hoff factor if your solute is an electrolyte. Kf is the cryoscopic constant which depends upon the nature of solvent only. M is the molality of solution. Now, I am going to tell you something very important. Please remember for dilute solutions, molality is equal to molarity. For dilute solutions, please remember molality can be taken to be equal to the molarity. Okay. So in this formula, although we need molality, they have given uh, molarity, but it, it's okay, right? For dilute solution, molality is equal to molarity. Also, they have talked about Van't Hoff factor. So now this is the time when you should directly remember how to solve the question in the uh, least time possible, right? So let me tell you that in the case of dissociation, we will never tell you, right? Uh, though they have given in here, what is a percentage dissociation? But please remember that all electrolytes in aqueous medium, they will uh, dissociate. For example, if you're adding a salt, if you're adding a, an acid or a base, so they will definitely dissociate. Association is something which uh, examiner indicates in the question that this solute is associating. What I'm trying to say is that supposing I give you a question that NaCl is added to water, so calculate any colligative property. Now, by the common knowledge of chemistry, you know that when NaCl is dissolved in water, it dissociates. So, you should not need to be told that NaCl will actually dissociate, right? Okay. So, association is something which we indicate. So, please remember that Van't Hoff factor is 1 plus alpha N minus 1 in case of dissociation, right? You may uh, remember this formula in a different form. Uh, this is the form I prefer, right? Uh, Van't Hoff factor is 1 plus alpha and minus 1. So, in case of dissociation, Van't Hoff factor is uh, greater than 1. Alpha is the degree of dissociation, right? It ranges between 0 and 1. N is the number of particles formed upon dissociation. N is number of particles formed upon dissociation. For example, acetic acid breaks down into two particles, acetate ion and H plus ion, okay? So we'll uh, discuss uh, more of this formula in the question, right? But what, what happens if the solute undergoes association? Then your Van't Hoff factor is less than one. Remember that, okay? Van't Hoff factor is less than one if the solute undergoes association. In that case, the formula I prefer to write in this way, right? I is equal to 1 minus, Vento factor is less than 1, alpha n minus 1 by n. In this case, n is a number of particles that associate. Here, n is the number of particles that associate. Alright, so now let us apply all this knowledge to this question. The question is percentage of dissociation. So basically, they have asked 100 alpha, right? Your answer would be 100 multiplied by alpha, 100 multiplied by degree of dissociation. Alpha I can calculate if I calculate the Van't Hoff factor, right? Alpha I can easily calculate if I calculate the Van't Hoff factor. 
So I will apply this formula delta Tf is I Kf M. Right, delta Tf is I Kf M. Now uh, please try to do calculation as smartly as possible. As in, if you have multiple steps of calculation, do not calculate at every step. Right, this is one way of doing the question in short time. Accumulate the numbers and then do all the calculation in one go. Be careful, but uh, if you cal do the calculation in one go only, that way you will save some time. Okay, so I'll show you how delta Tf is I Kf M. Right, so depression in freezing point was found to be 0.0198 degrees Celsius. Right, 0 0.0198 degrees Celsius. Vent off factor I will calculate. Kf, the cryoscopic constant is given to be 1.85. All right, we will do just one calculation here. Okay, right, then 1.85 multiplied by molality. So I told you for dilute solutions, molality is equal to molarity. So 1.2 ml of acetic acid, which has the density 1.02 gram per ml, right? So you guys know mass is equal to volume into density. Right, so volume is given to be 1.2 ml and density is given to be 1.02. Right, so volume multiplied by density that gives you mass. Now you divide it by molar mass of acetic acid, which is 60. Divided by the molar mass of acetic acid, which is 60. So mass divided by molar mass, that is number of moles, and divided by the volume, which is 2 liter, that will give you the molarity now you can see that we are dissolving only a little amount of the sol uh, solute so this is a dilute solution and i can take molarity in place of molality all right now what will be the expression of vent hoff factor here so vent hoff factor will be 1 plus alpha acetic acid will give two ions obviously one acetate and another H plus. So there are two particles. So remember the expression uh, 1 plus alpha n minus 1, right? So 1 plus alpha 2 minus 1, which is simply 1 plus alpha. All right. Okay. So vent Hoff factor in this case is 0 0.0198 multiplied by uh, 120 divided by 1.85 into 1.2 into 1.02. Now equate it equal to 1 plus alpha, right? And do this calculation. So you have saved on a lot of uh, calculation steps here. Directly we can get the answer here, okay? So alpha, you will calculate from here and then you will multiply that by 100, the percentage of dissociation of the acid, okay? So solve this, I'm telling you the answer here, that would be approximately 5%, right? The answer would be approximately 5%. Do this calculation, okay? And then cross check your answer. Okay. If you have any doubt, just do let us know in the comments. Uh, we'll try our best to answer that. Moving to the next question, Henry's law. So uh, generally there uh, either there is a numerical on Henry's law very frequently or they ask some uh, conceptual question based on Henry's law. Okay. So this is one good question that was uh, that has been asked in PYQs. So I picked this up. Which one of the following statements regarding Henry's law is not correct? Okay, so you have to skip the ones which are correct. You have to pick the one which is uh, not correct. So Henry's law, let me uh, tell you guys, Henry's law is about the solubility of a gaseous substance in a liquid solvent. Okay, now Henry's law can be expressed in many forms, right? Because Henry's law simply says that the solubility of a gas in a liquid is directly proportional to the partial pressure of the gaseous substance in the vapor phase. Now it depends upon you what unit for the solubility of gas do you choose. For example, one common unit is mole fraction. Okay. So let us first see what does Henry's law say. Then we will come back to this. So Henry's law basically just says that solubility of any gas is proportional to its partial pressure. Right. But you guys know that one of the very common forms of Henry's law that we use is P is equal to KHx, right? P is the partial pressure of the gas. In the vapor phase, KH is called Henry's law constant. KH is called Henry's law constant, right? 
and x is the mole fraction of the gas so you know that is the way of expressing the solubility of the gas right so this is basically the mole fraction of gas in water right or whatever your solvent is okay now can you guys tell me from this equation how can you relate the value of henry's law constant of a gas with the solubility of the gas of course you just have to rearrange this equation right so i can write this equation again as kh is equal to p by x so you can see that henry's law constant is inversely proportional to solubility henry's law constant is inversely proportional to solubility right a more soluble gas has lower value of henry's law constant and a less soluble gas has higher value of henry's law constant also please note that henry's law constant depends upon three factors henry's law constant depends upon three factors what are those three factors first the nature of gas second the nature of solvent and third temperature right henry's law constant depends upon which gas you are considering second which solvent you are choosing to dissolve that gas in and third what is the temperature you are taking okay now we have discussed that henry's law constant is inversely proportional to solubility can you guys tell me what is the variation of henry's law constant with temperature yes you see supposing x is a gas supposing x is a gas you are dissolving it in let's say water right so when you are dissolving a gas in water basically you are doing the condensation of the gas right gas earlier it was in the gas phase x and then it came in the aqueous phase so dissolution of a gas in a liquid is basically a condensation process now tell me guys condensation is exothermic or endothermic generally speaking right if i say gases have higher kinetic energy or liquids have higher kinetic energy of course gases have higher kinetic energy so when a gas condenses into the aqueous form this has to be an exothermic process that means dissolution of gases generally it is an exothermic process now from lee chatelier's principle we know that exothermic processes are favored at low temperature right when you lower the temperature you are withdrawing heat system will do the opposite system will generate more heat so reaction will move in the forward direction okay so at low temperature the solubility of the gas will be more is that clear so solubility of gases please remember it depends upon temperature inversely the solubility of a gas depends inversely upon temperature okay now combine these two henry's law constant inversely proportional to solubility solubility inversely proportional to temperature so of course henry's law constant will be directly proportional to temperature all right so this is all that you should know about henry's law coming back to the question which one of the following statements regarding henry's law is not correct first is higher the value of kh at a given pressure higher is the solubility of the gas in the liquid so yes this is not correct if the value of kh is high higher the value of kh right higher is the solubility no we just saw that kh is inversely proportional to solubility so if the value of kh is high the solubility is low right so this is not correct right this is not correct different gases have different kh value at the same temperature yes Henry's law constant is a function of nature of gas, nature of solvent, and temperature. So different gases will have different values. Henry's law constant that is correct. The partial pressure of the gas in vapor phase is proportional to the mole fraction of gas in the solution. Correct. The partial pressure of the gas in vapor phase is proportional to mole fraction of gas in solution. That is the general statement of Henry's law, right? The value of KH increases with increase in temperature. and kh is a function of the nature of gas this is also correct right we just saw that kh is directly proportional to temperature right and it does depend upon the nature of gas so the value of kh increases with increase in temperature and kh is a function of the nature of gas absolutely correct so the incorrect statement is option 1 all right moving to the next question you might have figured it out it is from raoult's law whenever we talk about the vapor pressures of two liquids just understand this is based on raoult's law and the question uh, particularly the numericals on raoult's law they are not very difficult guys okay 
so let us uh, you can pause the video and solve the question come back and check here later for those of you who need revision of this topic let's get started with raoult's law so raoult's law basically it is applicable to a mixture of volatile liquids okay right so i'll just uh, straight away come to the important equations according to raoult's law let's say if there are two liquids a and b both of which are volatile then the partial pressure of a in a mixture of a and b it will be p not a x a right simply p not a is the vapor pressure of pure a in a container which contains only a and x a is the mole fraction of a in that mixture liquid mixture similarly the partial pressure of b is p not b and x b right p b is the vapor pressure of b in the mixture p not b is the vapor pressure of just b when it is pure and x b is the mole fraction of b in the mixture now to determine the total pressure we assume that the liquids are ideal which enables us to apply the dalton's law of partial pressure right so as per dalton's law of partial pressure total pressure is p a plus p b which gives us p not a x a plus p not b x b right now you can modify this equation by eliminating one of the mole fractions for example you guys know that x a plus x b is 1 right the sum of mole fractions of all the uh, components in a solution is always 1 so you can replace either x a or x b and derive the expression uh, i will directly go to the mole fractions in vapor phase right so these are the mole fractions x a and x b they are applicable in liquid phase what about vapor phase mole fractions in vapor phase so again dalton's law will come to our rescue right again dalton's law will come to our rescue okay remember dalton's law says that partial pressure of any gas is the total pressure multiplied by mole fraction of the gas remember this from the dalton's law partial pressure of any gas is total pressure multiplied by mole fraction of the gas now x symbol we have taken for liquid phase mole fraction so for gas phase mole fraction i will take y right just to avoid confusion so now you can see that uh, i can rearrange this y1 i can write as p1 divided by p total right and y2 i can write as p2 divided by p total so you can see guys in quickly within 5 minutes we are revising the entire topic right the important points the summary the gist extract juice of the concept so y1 is p1 by p total y2 is p2 by p total now you know that p1 is this right p1 not x1 and of course p total is p1 not x1 plus p2 not x2 similarly p2 is p not 2 x2 divided by p not 1 x1 plus p not 2 x2 all right okay so now let us solve this question the vapor pressures of pure liquids a and b are 400 and 600 okay so you can see that this is p not a and this is p not b right this is p not a vapor pressure of pure a this is p not b vapor pressure of pure b on mixing the two liquids the sum of their initial volumes is equal to the volume of the final mixture why have they given this do you remember this is the property of ideal solutions that their volume of mixing is zero their enthalpy of mixing is zero when you mix two liquids and uh, the total volume is the sum of the individual volumes that means it's a, it's an ideal solution right so we can apply raoult's law that is what it is right the mole fraction of liquid b is 0.5 i told you that the sum of mole fractions is always 1 so if mole fraction of b is 0.5 mole fraction of a is also 0.5 1 minus 0.5 okay now let us calculate the total pressure right because i think they have asked the total pressure yes the vapor pressure of the final solution they have asked so very simple this is p not a x a plus p not b x b so p not a we know it is 400 multiplied by 0.5 plus p not b is 600 multiplied by 0.5 okay so that is 200 this is 300 that is 500 
millimeter mercury right so 500 so option either 2 or 4 could be the correct answer right so this is uh, 500 millimeter mercury is the total pressure now they have asked also the mole fraction of the components a and b in the vapor phase the formulas i discussed here okay so mole fraction of component a y a okay now see how i'm doing this mole fraction of a in the vapor phase is p a divided by p total from here you can see p a uh, is this right you got it right so p a is this p not a x a which is 400 into 0 0.5 and 200 so this is p a is 200 all right divided by p total p total is 500 we just calculated okay shortening the calculation so how much is this uh, this is 0 0.4 right y a the mole fraction of component a in the vapor phase is 0 0.4 and because the sum of mole fractions is 1 so y b will of course be 1 minus 0 0.4 which is 0 0.6 all right so this is the correct answer 0 0.4 and 0 0.6 okay so that is how uh, the questions on Raoult's law are asked okay and that is how you do the calculation and here the correct answer is option 4 okay now uh, moving to the next question uh, this is based on osmotic pressure right so we have covered uh, freezing point depression in freezing point okay similarly there are other colligative properties like elevation of boiling point relative lowering of vapor pressure and osmotic pressure so this is an important method you guys know because this method is preferred for measuring the molar masses of non-volatile solutes particularly large molecules because first thing the measurement is done at room temperature and second thing is the value of osmotic pressure is very large even for dilute solutions right so what is uh, osmotic pressure this is the minimum pressure that you should apply towards the solution of higher concentration to stop the flow of solvent molecules that is the process of osmosis now we know that osmotic pressure it is given by this equation please remember we also call it Venthoff equation after the name of the scientist pi is osmotic pressure i is the Venthoff factor if your uh, solute is electrolyte c is the molar concentration basically this is molarity right and r is universal gas constant and this time we will take generally uh, the value is 0 0.08 2, right liter atm or bar because the pressure is in atm or bar then t is the temperature in kelvin so sometimes uh, the question is directly asked they will give you some of these uh, information and they will ask you what is osmotic pressure what is concentration like that okay but this question these are also very common they compare the osmotic pressure of two solutions right so let us uh, read the question the osmotic pressure of a dilute solution of an ionic compound xy so please from here we deduce that uh, please understand this this is an ionic compound xy it will dissociate into x plus and y minus maybe right like this it will give two particles it will give two particles in water is four times that of a solution of 0 0.01 molar barium chloride it will give three particles three ions right in water assuming complete dissociation of the given ionic compounds what is the concentration of xy in solution now we know that uh, osmotic pressure is a colligative property it only depends upon the relative number of solute particles right so the osmotic pressure of a dilute solution of xy is four times the osmotic pressure of barium chloride let us write this information osmotic pressure of the solution xy okay read the question very carefully osmotic pressure of a solution of xy is four times four times the osmotic pressure of barium chloride right okay if you are solving this question then you can pause the video right as i told you earlier solve your question and check your answer here so osmotic pressure of compound xy in water is four times osmotic pressure because of the barium chloride solution now from this equation we know that osmotic pressure is icrt rt is constant that will cancel out so we will just le uh, we be left with i into c that is concentration into the van t hoff factor now please remember for complete dissociation van t hoff factor is same as the number of ions produced upon dissociation right so osmotic pressure i can equate it to van t hoff factor multiplied by concentration van t hoff factor of x y is 2 because it gives two particle right 
or if for your clarity uh, i can uh, write it that venthoff factor multiplied by concentration for xy is four times multiplied by venthoff factor multiplied by concentration of barium chloride right because osmotic pressures uh, is four times so we can write that okay then venthoff factor for xy it is 2 venthoff factor of xy it is 2 it gives two particles upon dissociation 4 multiplied by what is venthoff factor for barium chloride for complete dissociation it is equal to number of particles which is 3 right so this is 3 and concentration of barium chloride it is given to be 0 0.01 right so concentration of xy it will be 6 into 10 raised to the power minus 2 that is a correct answer okay so these questions in j main specifically they are very common they compare the osmotic pressures of two different solutions right and then they ask the concentration of one uh, solution or the molar mass of some solute or the vent of factor of another solute like that now moving to the next question this comes from bohr's model please remember the equations uh, involved in the bohr's model very carefully right the radius of the second bohr orbit in terms of the bore radius a naught in lithium ion so what is the formula of the radius right what is the formula of the radius so radius of nth orbit radius of nth orbit is rn a naught n square by z okay uh, the unit of the radius will be same as the unit of the bore radius right uh, a naught so this is a formula for the radius a naught uh, which is you know 0 0.529 angstrom or 52.9 picometer n is the principal quantum number the shell in which the electron is present and z is the atomic number right we are talking about lithium that means z is 3 right we are talking about lithium so atomic number z is 3 and we are talking about the radius of the second bore orbit that is n is equal to n is equal to 2 right so the radius would be a naught multiplied by 2 square divided by 3 which is 4 a naught divided by 3 that will be the correct answer right so there are, there have been many questions in uh, j based on the formula of the radius of the nth orbit of hydrogen atom right or similar uh, hydrogen like species of 4 a naught by 3 that is the correct answer then moving to the next question energy postulate the most important postulate of Bohr's model the energy of an electron in the first Bohr orbit of hydrogen atom is minus 13.6 electron volt the question is the possible energy values of the excited states will be which of these energies are possible for uh, for the electron which is in one of the excited states in the hydrogen atom so let us first see the formula uh, involved here in uh, detail so hydrogen atom <coughs> you know what is the formula the energy of electron in nth orbit of hydrogen like species is minus Rydberg constant z square by n square all right if the electron is free okay listen to this carefully i'll explain a lot of important concepts here right so if the electron is free so n is equal to infinity if the electron is free n is equal to infinity it is at infinite distance from the nucleus because the attractive force is zero right this means that e infinity will be zero if you put infinity uh, n as infinity so anything upon infinity zero that means the energy of a free electron is taken to be zero please remember that the energy of a free electron is taken to be zero it is not bound to the nucleus for any finite value of n the energy of electron is negative this energy of electron which is negative it clearly means that electron is bound to the nucleus right electron is bound to the nucleus or that there is an attractive force there is an attractive force between the nucleus and the electron now Rydberg constant is rh it can have many values depending upon the units that you choose right so for example i'll tell you some of the values Rydberg constant can be written as 2.18 into 10 raised to the power minus 18 this is joule per atom right that is it is calculated per atom and uh, in terms of joule if you are calculating 
uh, in terms of electron volt this is 13.6 electron volt per atom right you can also calculate it in terms of kilojoule that will be kilojoule per mole so there are many values of Rydberg constant uh, some of which you should remember because they uh, might save your time in the examination right in calculation so these are the values of Rydberg constant now they have asked what are the possible values of the excited state now you guys know that for hydrogen atom n is equal to 1 is the ground state n is equal to 1 is the ground state so any higher state will be excited state so let us calculate the energy so let us calculate the energy in the second orbit right which is minus 13.6 divided by 2 square that is minus 13.6 divided by 4 right what will be the answer minus 4 uh, minus 3.4 so yes this is a correct answer this is a possible value right the energy of electron in first excited state that is n is equal to 2 that is minus 3.4 let us calculate the energy in third excited state uh, sorry second excited state that is n is equal to 3 so minus 13.6 divided by 3 square so which is minus 13.6 divided by 9 so this is minus uh, 1.5 okay so did you notice that the energy in ground state is minus 13.6 electron volt energy in second state that is first excited state that is minus 3.4 energy in third state that is second excited state is minus 1.5 right so no value between 13.6 and 3.4 will be allowed so uh, neither this or neither this right so these values will not be allowed that is the meaning that is exactly the quantization of energy that Bohr introduced into his model right so the possible energies are minus 3.4 and minus 1.5 moving to the next question what is the wave number for the shortest wavelength transition in the Balmer series so please remember the different spectral lines in the emission spectrum of hydrogen because again there are many questions so first line uh, first series of lines that we study is Lyman then Balmer right then Paskin then bracket then fun and last is not very important Humphrey all right so these uh, five are basically the main sets of spectral lines in the emission spectrum of hydrogen Lyman, Balmer, Paskin, bracket, fun in Lyman series the electron drops in first orbit here electron drops in second orbit, here in third orbit, here in fourth orbit, here in fifth orbit. So obviously you get a Lyman line when electron drops from drops from any higher orbit that is second, third, fourth into first orbit. Okay. Now we can calculate two types of transition, the one having maximum energy and the one having minimum energy. Okay. So obviously if you are getting a Lyman line, your electron drops in first orbit for minimum energy, it should start from second, right? For minimum energy, it should start from second. And for maximum energy, it should start from infinity. What I'm trying to say is that for minimum energy transition, your initial value of the principal quantum number should be final plus one. That's it, right? Initial is, uh, state for emission spectrum. The initial uh, quantum number will be just one greater than high uh, final quantum number. So electron drops to one, it should be initially in two, right? So n final is one. So one plus one is two, n initial is two. But for maximum energy, it should start as high as possible. So simple n initial should be infinity, right? For maximum energy, electron should start from infinity, okay? Now you guys know energy is inversely proportional to wavelength. So minimum energy or maximum wavelength and similarly maximum energy corresponds to minimum wavelength that is what precisely the question here is what is the wave number for the shortest wavelength transition that is the shortest wavelength minimum wavelength that is maximum energy so you just have to do one thing take n initial as infinity right so here uh, for convenience they have given the Rydberg constant also so uh, what will be the value here uh, let's see so the wave number I'll calculate here itself is 109737 multiplied by electron starts from which uh, infinity right and it drops where Lyman-Balmer electron drops in the second orbit right 
so 1 upon 2 square minus 1 upon infinity square okay it starts from infinity and it drops to 2 that will be the maximum energy or the minimum wavelength transition so 1 upon infinity 0 1 upon 2 square 4 so 109737 divided by 4 109737 divided by 4 now you know that will be approximately 27434 centimeter inverse right so we have understood uh, how the questions on hydrogen spectrum they are asked in j right then this question this question i picked because it is related to photoelectric effect when a metal m was irradiated with a light frequency of 1.6 into 10 to the power 16 hertz the emitted photoelectrons had twice the kinetic energy as that of the photoelectrons that were emitted when the metal was irradiated with a frequency of this hertz okay so this question i selected because it involves the use of einstein's photoelectric equation right do you guys remember what was einstein's photoelectric equation that the maximum kinetic energy of the emitted ejected electrons that is h nu that is the energy of the incident photon minus work function right so this is the only equation based on all numericals of photoelectric effect depend okay so please understand this equation very thoroughly the maximum kinetic energy of the electron is h nu the energy of the incident photon minus phi is the work function so let me just elaborate here maximum kinetic energy this is for electron guys okay so you can also write it as half mass of electron and velocity of a square because it is maximum kinetic energy so this, this will be maximum velocity right h nu you can write it either as uh, h nu or h c by lambda or h c nu bar you guys know that is by virtue of Planck's uh, equation right the energy of a photon is h nu if the frequency is nu or h c by lambda if the frequency of the uh, wavelength of the photon is lambda or wave number right phi is the work function because it is a form of energy it can also be ex uh, expressed as this normally right so phi i can write as h nu naught where nu naught is threshold frequency you must have heard of it and also i can write hc by lambda naught where lambda naught is a critical wavelength right but all of that is not required in this question uh, so much extensive let us go back to the question again a metal m had twice the kinetic energy as that of the second case okay i would if i were to solve this question i would simplify first okay the given information into a mathematical relation so first of all what do we do information we keep in a mathematical form in a simplified form in a simplified form the metal when it was irradiated with so much frequency then the energy of energy the kinetic energy electron was twice the second case so I will simply say that the first kinetic energy will be twice the second kinetic energy right it's not clear right first case the kinetic energy is twice the kinetic energy of the second case so k1 is twice of k2 अब हमें पता है कि जो काइनेटिक एनर्जी है दैट इज एच न्यू माइनस फाइ ओके और क्वेश्चन है व्हाट इज द थ्रेशोल्ड फ्रीक्वेंसी तो हमें ये वाला फॉर्मूला यूज करना पड़ेगा प्लीज रिमेंबर दैट ठीक है इन फर्स्ट केस जो फ्रीक्वेंसी यूज कर रहे हैं वो ये है न्यू वन और सेकेंड केस में जो फ्रीक्वेंसी यूज कर रहे हैं दैट इज ये न्यू टू ठीक है तो जो फॉर्मूला हम यूज करेंगे वो हम आप लोग को बता देता हूं यहां पर के मैं ऐसे लिख सकता हूं एच न्यू वन माइनस एच न्यू नॉट राइट Kinetic energy is energy of the incident photon h nu one minus work function, which I will choose as h nu naught. Because question me pucha hua what is the threshold frequency nu naught? ठीक है तो ये h nu naught हो गया. यहाँ पर kinetic energy of the second case. तो ये भी मैं ऐसे लिखूँगा h nu two minus h nu naught. Is that clear? यहाँ पे हम लोग क्या कर सकते हैं h common लेके काट सकते हैं. राइट प्लैंक्स कांस्टेंट तो ये बचेगा आपका न्यू वन माइनस न्यू नॉट और ये हो जाएगा टू न्यू टू माइनस टू न्यू नॉट इज दैट क्लियर टू न्यू नॉट को इधर ले आओ प्लस टू न्यू नॉट माइनस न्यू नॉट इज न्यू नॉट एंड टू न्यू टू टेक इट दैट साइड न्यू वन नाउ इन द नेक्स्ट लाइन यू विल गेट योर आंसर सी दैट इज हाउ वी सॉल्व दिस क्वेश्चन फर्स्ट सिंप्लीफाई द इक्वेशन इन टू easy looking equation right so now what will we do here we will simply 2 multiplied by nu2 nu2 value how much is it? 1 into 10 to the power 16 hertz right 
और न्यूमन की वैल्यू कितनी दे रखी है वन पॉइंट सिक्स इंटू टेन पार सिक्सटीन हर्ट्स सो ये हमारी हो गई दिस ठीक है तो जो थ्रेश फ्रीक्वेंसी है वो हो गई टू इंटू सिक्सटीन टेन पार सिक्सटीन माइनस वन पॉइंट सिक्स तो जीरो पॉइंट फोर इंटू टेन पार सिक्सटीन हर्ट्स और फोर इंटू टेन टू दार फिफ्टीन हर्ट्स राइट सो दैट इज द करेक्ट आंसर Is that clear, right? So that is a question which involves the use of Einstein's famous photoelectric equation. ठीक है? चलो बढ़ते हैं अगले क्वेश्चन की तरफ. ये वाला क्वेश्चन, Planck's equation. तो ऐसा भी देखा जाता है कि काफी इक्वेशन Planck's equation में based आते हैं, right? काफी ऐसे टॉपिक्स हैं जैसे कोई भी एनर्जी होगी, for example, coordination compound में हम लोग crystal field theory पढ़ते हैं. वहाँ पे हमारा CFC value होता है. उसमें कई बार पूछ लेते हैं कि एनर्जी विल बी गिवन व्हाट इज अ वेवलेंथ और वेवलेंथ इज गिवन व्हाट इज एनर्जी सो प्लांस इक्वेशन जो है ना इट्स अ वेरी बेसिक इक्वेशन राइट फॉर द इंटर कन्वर्जन ऑफ एनर्जी विद फ्रीक्वेंसी वेव नंबर एटसेट्रा ठीक है तो हम लोग जानते हैं कि जो एनर्जी है गाइज दैट इज आइदर एच न्यू और एच सी बायडा राइट और एच सी न्यू बार फ्रिक्वेंसी वेवलेंथ वेव नंबर अब उसने पूछा है एनर्जी ऑफ वन मोल फोटोन्स ऑब्वियसली वन मोल से मल्टीप्लाई कर देना तो एनर्जी ऑफ वन मोल फोटॉन्स एज इन एवोगेटो नंबर से मल्टीप्लाई कर दें और वेवलन दे रखी है तो एन ए एच सी बाई लैमडा ज्यादा डिफिकल्ट नहीं है सिंपल है एनर्जी ऑफ वन मोल फोटॉन्स बोल रहा है जिसकी वेवलन 300 हंड्रेड नाइनोमीटर है तो उसने कॉन्स्टेंट्स भी दे रखे हैं सिक्स पॉइंट जीरो टू इंटू टेन रस टू दार ट्वेंटी थ्री एच की वैल्यू दे रखी है सिक्स पॉइंट सिक्स थ्री इंटू टेन रस टू माइनस थर्टी फोर और सी की वैल्यू देखिए है टेन रस थ्री इंटू टेन रस टू द पार एट डिवाइडेड बाय वेवलेंथ है थ्री हंड्रेड नैनोमीटर टेन रस टू माइनस नाइन मीटर राइट सो ये आप लोग कैंसिल कर लो ये इसको अब ये जूल में आएगा तो डोंट फॉरगेट टू कन्वर्ट इट इनटू यू नो किलो जूल बाई डिवाइडिंग इट बाई थाउजेंड इसको थाउजेंड से डिवाइड कर लेना तो ये किलो जूल में आ जाएगा ठीक है Is that clear? तो यहां से जो हमारा आंसर है वो करेक्ट आ जाएगा आई थिंक थ्री नाइनटी नाइन विल बी द करेक्ट आंसर एक बार कैलकुलेशन चेक कर लेना ठीक है नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन अगेन एक क्वालिगेटिव प्रॉपर्टी भी बेस्ड क्वेश्चन है जो सोल्यूट ए है वो एसोसिएट्स इन वॉटर अब उसने एसोसिएट जो वॉटर में वो करता है ये बोल रखा है वेन जीरो पॉइंट सेवन ग्राम ऑफ सोल्यूट ए इज डिजोल्व इन फोर्टी टू ग्राम ऑफ वॉटर इट डिप्रेसिस द फ्रीजिंग पॉइंट बाई जीरो पॉइंट टू डिग्री सेल्सियस तो अपने आपसे पूछो कि जो वैल्यूज दे रखी है न्यूमेरिकल वॉट डू द रिप्रेजेंट क्या रिप्रेजेंट करती है वो तो जीरो पॉइंट सेवन ग्राम सॉल्यूट दे रखा है ठीक है अगर इसको मैं डिवाइड करूंगा सॉल्यूट के मोलर मास से जो नाइनटी थ्री दे रखा है तो ये हो जाएगा नंबर ऑफ मोल्स राइट ये क्या हो जाएगा नंबर ऑफ मोल्स तो ये मेरा नंबर ऑफ मोल्स हो गया आई एम डूइंग इट स्टेप वाइज टू क्लैरिफाई राइट तो गिवन मास ऑफ सॉल्यूट डिवाइडेड बाई मोलर मास नंबर ऑफ मोल्स ये हम कितने वाटर में कर रहे हैं 42 ग्राम वाटर में कर रहे हैं तो मोलालिटी कितनी हो जाएगी हमारी मोलालिटी हो जाएगी नंबर ऑफ मोल्स डिवाइडेड बाय मास ऑफ सॉल्वेंट 42 इन केजी तो केजी के लिए हम थाउजेंड से डिवाइड करेंगे डिनोमिनेटर को या न्यूमिनेटर को मल्टीप्लाई कर देंगे ठीक है तो दिस विल बी और मोलालिटी ऑफ द सोल्यूशन नाउ इट इज गिवन द फ्रीजिंग पॉइंट डिप्रेशन विच वी नो इट इज आई के एफ एम तो वैल्यू सब कर दें यहाँ पे जल्दी से तो डिप्रेशन इन फ्रीजिंग पॉइंट है वो हमारा 0.2 हो गया राइट right? वेंट ऑफ फैक्टर हम लोग निकालेंगे अब इस क्वेश्चन में थोड़ी एम्बिगिटी है एक्चुअली उसने ये नहीं बताया कि एसोसिएट करके बना क्या रहा है और ये प्रीवियस ईयर क्वेश्चन राइट तो डायमराइजेशन है ट्राइमराइजेशन तो यहां पे डायमराइजेशन एज्यूम किया गया है कि दो पार्टिकल जो है वो कंबाइन कर रहे हैं ठीक है इन दिस क्वेश्चन इट हैज बिन अज्यूम्ड दैट टू पार्टिकल्स ऑफ ए They are combining to form A2, right? And remember earlier in one of the question, मैंने बताया था आप लोगों को कि association में वेंट ऑफ फैक्टर होता है वन माइनस एल्फा एन माइनस वन बाय एन और अगर दो पार्टिकल्स कंबाइन कर रहे हैं n की वैल्यू टू है तो टू माइनस वन बाई टू विच इज वन बाई टू सो वेंट ऑफ फैक्टर इज वन माइनस एल्फा बाई टू राइट तो यहाँ पे वेंट ऑफ फैक्टर निकाल लेते हैं पहले के एफ हमें कितने दे रखा है वन पॉइंट एट सिक्स के एफ इज वन पॉइंट एट सिक्स एंड मोलालिटी is 0.7 into 1000 divided by uh, 93 into 42. तो बहुत सिंपल है इस यहां से आप लोग निकालिए वेंट ऑफ फैक्टर ठीक है ना कितना आ जाएगा वेंट ऑफ फैक्टर 
जीरो पॉइंट टू इंटू नाइन्टी थ्री इंटू फोर्टी टू डिवाइडेड बाई वन पॉइंट एट सिक्स इंटू जीरो पॉइंट सेवन इंटू थाउजेंड राइट तो यू कैन डू दिस कैलकुलेशन एंड यू कैन फाइंड दैट वेंट ऑफ फैक्टर विल बी सिक्स बाई टेन विच इज जीरो पॉइंट सिक्स राइट सो वेंट ऑफ फैक्टर हमारा कितना आ गया यहाँ पे जीरो पॉइंट सिक्स आ गया कैलकुलेशन कर लोगे आप लोग अब वेंट ऑफ फैक्टर किसके बराबर है वन माइनस एल्फा बाई टू के बराबर है ठीक है तो वन माइनस एल्फा बाई टू जो है दैट इज इक्वल टू जीरो पॉइंट सिक्स ठीक है तो एल्फा बाई टू कितना हो जाएगा जीरो पॉइंट फोर एंड एल्फा कितना हो जाएगा जीरो पॉइंट एट इसका मतलब एट्टी परसेंट जो है हमारा वो इसमें एसोसिएशन हो रहा है डायमराइजेशन हो रहा है ठीक है तो दैट इज हाउ यू अप्रोच एंड सॉल्व दिस क्वेश्चन राइट तो दैट सॉल्व इन दिस प्रैक्टिस सेशन राइट जहां पे हम लोगों ने सारे इंपॉर्टेंट कॉन्सेप्ट कवर किए हैं ऑल द मेजर इंपॉर्टेंट कॉन्सेप्ट फ्रॉम विच चे वेरी फ्रिक्वेंटली आस्क क्वेश्चन राइट इन द नेक्स्ट यूट्यूब सेशन वी विल बी कमिंग अप विद द इम्पॉर्टेंट क्वेश्चन एंड कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ सम मोर चैप्टर्स फ्रॉम फिजिकल केमिस्ट्री प्लीज स्टेट यून राइट एंड टेक केयर बाय